Hi. I wanted to talk to you about listening. You can turn this video off right now and you can go to any number of Thich Nhat Hanh sources on the internet or to your favorite guru, whether it be a counselor, a psychologist, a new age author, to learn about listening. I could recommend Krishnamurti, Leo Biscaglia, Eric Fromm, maybe, Wayne Dyer, but you've got me here, so let me tell you what I think. A few minutes ago, I went to my mother to suggest that she tell a friend that that friend should go to a nutritionist. My mother is receptive to the idea, but halfway through my sentence, she said, you can't talk to old people. Now, my mom's an old person, and when she wants to, she really listens. But what she means is the old people who are set in their ways don't listen a lot more than she doesn't listen. I don't want to talk about my mother or her friend. It's more or less hopeless, especially regarding the friend. My mother does listen to a degree, as long as it doesn't have to do with evolution or cosmology is safe. She doesn't really make the connection right away. But anyway, a lot of the problems in the world, which I've attributed to political correctness in the last few years, actually boil down to listening. And those problems boil down to loving yourself, which boils down to the ability to love others, or boils up. You know, first you love yourself, then you can love others, which means first you listen to yourself and then you can listen to others. Most people don't listen to themselves. That's why they find it easy without compunction not to listen to others. What do I mean by not listening to yourself? And by the way, this is an organic, extemporaneous talk, like all of my talks, but it's more organic than before because I'm not allowing myself to stay on a direct path. I'm letting the ideas that come through to lead to the next few ideas, and they're still weaving the topic I want to weave. People don't listen to themselves when they correct for religion and politics. So, for example, a conservative realizes that he really likes one of Barack Obama's programs, but then he either unconsciously or consciously decides to talk it down because he thinks he shouldn't agree with Obama. And that has to do with or builds up identity politics. A person doesn't listen to him or herself, excuse me, when he or she realizes that something that he or she has been hitherto believing doesn't jive with what he or she just realized. Okay, in street talk, you stop believing something because it doesn't jive with your beliefs. For example, you read something about the age of the earth, but then you talk it down and right out of your mind and out of the body of your belief systems because you're a Christian and it doesn't, it doesn't jive with the modern day idea of using the genealogy of Christ, which is flawed by the way, um, to justify the age of the earth. Or you hear something about evolution which makes total sense to you on a cognitive, visceral level, but you stop believing it, ignoring it, or rather you ignore it, and you try to forget about it because it doesn't jive with Genesis. This is not listening to yourself. People will say, no, that's not not listening to yourself. Not listening to yourself is when you say, oh, I should get up early and I don't. Well, that's not listening to yourself too. But on much more important issues like politics, religion, and science, we don't listen to ourselves when our self tells us, because we talk to ourselves, hey, this is the truth, and then our ego says, no, that's not the truth because it doesn't jive with the group I'm part of and it doesn't jive with what I want to believe. You see, what's real has nothing to do with what you want to believe often, right? One of my friends, Mike Ryder, posted that the other day. Um, and that's the truth. <coughs> Excuse me. 
What we want to believe often has nothing to do with what the truth is. Now, if you've been following along, and if your brain acts unconsciously in an intelligent way, and I bet it does, as long as it's not been beaten down with culture-designed and self-designed selfish cognitive dissonance, if your brain works intelligently, you create or find the truth on your own all the time. That's why we say, mm, that makes sense to me. Right? You're in science class. You hear something you never heard of before. And after a few moments, you say, that makes sense to me. How dare you? How could you be saying that Newton's three laws make sense to you? Well, because we have an innate sense. Now, my conspiracy-minded natural law friends, who are on the right path, but they're being religious too, they will say that this is because of natural law, because what is natural and what is true is within us. That's more or less true or untrue, but we can find the truth, as I've said before, through meditation, listening to yourself. Now, some of my Dharma brothers will say, no, meditation isn't about listening, it's not about thinking, it's not about doing anything. Right. Vipassana meditation is not... Vipassana meditation is not about those things. But you can use it that way, even accidentally. What do I mean by that? You want to learn to listen? You learn to be quiet. You want to learn to be quiet? You don't just stop this thing. You stop, you stop this thing and this thing. What do I mean? Well, you're trying to sit in meditation. You're thinking about your phone bill. You're thinking about your mother's birthday. You're thinking about that thing that you didn't said that your girlfriend said you said and now you're in a fight. Or you're thinking about that thing that your boyfriend accused you of which you didn't do and now you're in a fight. Whatever. These thoughts keep coming and going. You let them go. Well, how can I let them go? They're going to come anyway. Exactly. You let them come and go. The best analogy I can think of, and I came up with this before I read it anywhere else about 10 years ago, is clouds. When you look at the sky and you look at the clouds, you have absolutely zero control over them, right? Unless you're a lunatic. And you enjoy the clouds, whatever shape and form they take. And you don't get aggravated. You don't say, oh, that, that cloud looks like an elephant. I want it to look like a donkey. You just let it go. If it's an elephant, it's an elephant. If it's a donkey, it's a donkey. If it's a portion of the anatomy, it's a portion of the anatomy. If it looks like Bugs Bunny, it looks like Bugs Bunny. You don't pay any mind to it. You let it go. Now, the way to make successful meditation successful is you don't continue on a, thought, a thought train, as I call it, with that image or idea or worry that you get. For example, you think of the phone bill, and maybe you thank yourself. Oh, good. It's good I remember the phone bill. And you let it go. If necessary, you think about something else. But in meditation, we're trying not to think. So in the sky, you see that cloud that looks like Bugs Bunny. Oh, that's funny. You don't say, and then Bugs Bunny runs down the hill and screams. You don't continue building on what you see or think, and you let it go. This is how you clear your mind, okay? People say, oh, I can't meditate. I keep thinking of things, and I can't let it go. So just experience it. You see, the first step in meditation is experiencing what comes through your mind. And the better and better you get at it, the less and less you hold on to those images, the less you build thought trains, the less you say, oh, she's mad at me. Will we be able to go on that date on Friday? You don't continue past the original thought, building on the thought. You don't build on the image. You don't build on the worry. Now, this helps you clear your mind. Once you've learned to clear your mind, or once you learn to just experience what's in it, you'll find things in there you didn't expect to find. This is where you start to find truths, or at least become aware of ideas that you're capable of, right? Extrapolate this out. If you do this long enough, or if you just learn to wash the kitchen floor or scrub the tile without really focusing on any of the thoughts that pass through your mind, you get <whistles> ideas, right? And oftentimes these ideas don't make sense and that's where we might get comedy or invention or they do make sense and that's where we get comedy and invention or answers to questions, right? And this is where you start to find truths, at least things that may be true to you or true to the paradigm that you imagined or heard of 
or are contemplating or worried about. You may even find answers to that problem with your boyfriend or girlfriend, to how to pay that bill, to how to satisfy that mom or dad. You see? But it all comes by listening, so to speak. It could be listening, it could be watching. It's really experiencing. Now, people who learn to do this without judgment are people who learn to face facts or mistruths or inventions or ideas within themselves or in the classroom when they're learning something or from a book or from a video or from a friend who's talking to you. You see, it's when we hold on really tightly to our identity. I'm a Jew. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a scientist. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. And I can't... I can't deviate from that or I will lose my identity, which is scary. That's when we close our mind off and we stop listening to books and videos and professors and friends. So to recap, most of our problems come from not listening. First, to ourselves. If you can't listen to yourself, if you can't experience the thoughts and ideas that come to yourself, through yourself, if you can't listen, at least listen, to the justifications or the confirmations or the denials of ideas in yourself. You can't do it with others. And this is why you can't love others if you don't love yourself, because loving begins with listening. Oh, I would like to learn to fly planes. Oh, but that's not right, because my religion says flying planes is evil, so I won't do it. This is not loving yourself. Yourself wants to fly planes. But your religion says don't fly planes, it's evil. So you don't fly planes. And now you've stepped onto a path of self-denial. Now, of course, if your religion says don't kill people, that's a good religion. That's a good example of religion controlling people, which is what religion's about. But good religions control you, you control yourself. Bad religions cause you to control other people. And that's what most of the theistic religions are about, but we won't get into that and pretend I didn't say it. Or listen and investigate it. Okay, so um, once you learn to listen to yourself, listen to the ideas which confirm or deny things for you, or at least set you on a path of investigating them, you can do that with others. And this is how we listen to friends. Friends have things that they have to say to us that we might not like. That's why they're friends. They're not just there to comfort you. They're there to guide you. Peter Gabriel said, a friend is someone who will tell you what you need to hear, even if he may lose you as a friend. You see, because he loves you more than he loves himself. Loving yourself selfishly would be lying to someone else so you can keep benefiting from the friendship. Loving that person generously means you try to foster that person's growth at the expense of yourself. And that's what love really is. Your happiness depends on that person's well-being and happiness. Robert Heinlein said that. People think love is feeling this sense of attraction and then indulging it. Well, that's part of it. But that comes after indulging the needs of the one you love. That's how you know you love that person. And indulging yourself is listening Oh, maybe uh, evolution is correct and Genesis is wrong. Investigating that means loving yourself because you want to find the truth. The truth is better for you and for others because it paints a picture of the universe which is accurate so people won't be fooled. Not lying to others is painting a picture of the universe when they depend on your testimony, which is true. So they can make inform decisions about their lives. That's why lying to the ones you love proves you don't really love them because you're willing to deceive them for your own benefit, which means falsifying their view of the universe when they're depending on you to tell them what it looks like in a particular situation. So that's where loving comes from, listening to yourself so you can tell yourself the truth, so you can bear honest witness, and then listening to others so you can see what they have to tell you because they love you and they want you to have an accurate picture of the world or they want you to have better solutions or they want you to know the truth about something that happened. Okay? Where does this lead? This leads to relationships beyond our loves. You have to listen to people in the street. You have to listen to people